All right, you guys, today I have with me Chris Frederick of Political Perspective. He's going to be talking uh, with us a little bit about the future of the left, how we think we might be able to move forward and uh, get progressive policies done. So I'm told that you've been thinking about this for a little bit. So uh, what, what are what are some of the general thoughts that, uh, that you have? Because, I mean, this is definitely a big, big debate. Yeah, it's it's a big question going on right now. Obviously, many of us that were, you know, really getting behind Bernie Sanders and and seeing that all kind of fizzle out are definitely in a in a disappointed spot and trying to figure out, well, how exactly do we move forward? What are the right steps to move forward to try to get some things accomplished that uh, that we're interested in? You know, <clears throat> excuse me. What, one of the things that's gotten me kind of excited was. Uh, just yesterday, two two state governors came out and made some moves that, while they're not necessarily um, fully what we would like to see as progressives, they're definitely a move in the right direction. So Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan came out and said that the frontline workers are now going to get uh, certain tuition paid for, so educational programs and at least the, the community college tuition paid for for the people. And that's going to include people not not just people working in hospitals, but also grocery store workers, delivery truck drivers, um, people that are keeping things moving right now, uh, they're going to get some college tuition. Now, I know it's not free college tuition for everyone, like, you know, Bernie Sanders was pushing, but I think this is a step in the right direction. And seeing some of these things happen at the state level, I think can be good because in general, people are not really big on change, especially major change. It's very frightening to people in general when you when you make a big change, even if they kind of like an idea or they think, well, that sounds like an, I, a good idea. It's scary to them to move forward with it. So if you can start seeing some of these things at state levels, um, I think it can kind of start to change minds in a way that is that is beneficial. So, you know, it while all, many of us would like to see, you know, a Bernie Sanders type college situation implemented, it's realistically, you know, reading the tea leaves, it's not going to happen, at least not in the next few years. So if this, the states can start implementing these things and they work well, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like you're running this experiment and then hopefully down the road, people will look at what Gretchen Whitmer did and said, you know, that worked out pretty well where she gave these people the opportunity to go to college that otherwise may not have had that opportunity. And look how, look how well it turned out for them. Right. And then uh, the other thing that happened yesterday, so Gavin Newsom, California governor, came out and said he's going to use the National Guard to put together these two things that are kind of a problem in the state right now. So we have, you know, we grow a lot of produce and, and create a lot of food in California. Uh, one of the things that's happening is because specific supply lines have been disrupted, uh, the food isn't getting to where it needs to get. So certain types of foods are grown specifically for restaurants. Well, that food isn't selling very well right now. And it's literally just rotting in fields. They're, they don't know what to do with it. So the National Guard's going to go in and they're basically stocking up food banks, which is uh, good because we have a, a huge rise in the number of people who need food. You know, people who were doing pretty well eight weeks ago are now finding themselves for the first time in their life, they they don't know how to get food because they don't have a job anymore. They're hungry. The families are hungry. So this is an idea that, you know, normally you would, you, if from a capitalist perspective, you need someone to come in and say, okay, I'm a, you know, I'm a billionaire and I've got shareholders behind me. I'm going to see there's food over here and hungry people over here. I'm going to find a way to put them together. And you need sort of the, you know, the, the free market to do that. Well, we, we didn't wait around for that in California. Governor Newsom just stepped up and said, okay, here's some food. Here's some hungry people. Let's put those two things together. So I think those kinds of things happening on a state level can definitely make people realize, okay, everything doesn't have to be about a profit margin. Maybe you can just consider what's good for society. What's good from a, from a, you know, more of a left standpoint where we make sure that not everything that we do has to have a dollar get made in the process. Maybe you can just take food, give it to people. So I, it's, I think it's kind of hitting home this idea that politics is local, where if, if we start seeing more and more things on a state level, it becomes easier to get people to understand that some of these things should be implemented on a national level. So then how do you actually start to get things done on the national level, right? Because you could end up in a situation where everything is completely piecemeal by state and then you know and then you know there could be conflicts and issues issues arise that way so how do you actually start to then actually get stuff done on the national level because i mean you do raise a good point there which is that 
you can maybe be able to fight sort of moneyed interest a little bit better on the state level because it might be in some sense, in some ways less penetrated because there's so much lobbying effort focused on, you know, national politicians, et cetera. And so you could start teaching people on the local level. But then at some point, ideally, right, you'd want to move it into the local level. Is that like, like how, how would you do that then? Uh, like move it onto the national level? Right. How, how would you make that jump? So I think if states are already leaning one direction, then it becomes easier to get everyone going that direction. So like one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years is there's been more and more of a push for, say, community colleges to be lower cost and to have in some places even the state is paying for it. Right. So if you've got states where you wouldn't even necessarily expect this kind of thing are passing laws that say, you know what, right now, community college is tuition free. So if you all of a sudden have a bunch of states that are getting on board with this where you're say, you know, and that's a very small slice of, of education is community colleges. But if all of a sudden it becomes, you know, you have a bunch of states where somewhere between 80 and 100 percent of your community college tuition is already covered, then it becomes that much easier, I think, at the national level to get people on board um, to say, OK, well, maybe this is something we should do at a national level. And then there'll be negotiations about what level that is. But I, I certainly think it moves forward. It moves ahead of, of where we're at now. And <clears throat> it, of course, it's difficult. You have to hit that, you know, that tipping point where you get enough states on board with a particular idea that that you can then do it at a national level. Right. So, I mean, if you talk about, say, healthcare, healthcare would be a, a pretty difficult thing to nationalize. And we saw how Obamacare hasn't exactly worked out splendidly for many, many reasons, right? There's, there's lots of reasons why it hasn't, hasn't gone well, but that definitely um, brings up the point that it can be very difficult to homogenize things over, the, over an entire country. But I think uh, any progress you make, like Obamacare, you know, as, as many problems as there's been with it, with being attacked and, and lawsuits and all this kind of stuff, it is getting it in the conversation that, well, maybe people should be covered, which we're seeing again during this pandemic is more people realizing, oh, this idea of having your job connected to your health care is pretty bad when all of a sudden everyone loses their job or a huge number of people lose their job. So, the, you know, um, it, things can definitely start at the national level, but I, I think it's going to be very difficult for some of these things that progressives want, even, even if Bernie Sanders was to become president. I mean, it seems unlikely to me that we're going to end up at the end of four years with Medicare for all or or free college tuition for people. Right. I mean, you're still going to have to get the the pop, you know, the mass number of people on board and voting for a thing. And the more states have already been able to allow people to get used to those ideas, I, I think it's it makes it more likely that these things could happen at a national level. But isn't there still all kinds of systemic obstacles on the national level, right? So there's, I mean, you know, you're talking gerrymandering, you're talking all kinds of voter suppression issues. I mean, these issues seem to be, are they inextricable or is there, what what, what things might be? No, that's exactly right because, and that, and that's a big thing that I, that I tend to go back to is, is democracy itself being in danger, right? And sometimes if, when I say, well, you know, if, if we go through another four years of what we've just had, I don't know if we're going to have democracy in four years. And people kind of roll their eyes and think, well, no, we'll still be voting. And I agree with that. I think no matter what happens, no matter who becomes president four years from now, we're going to vote. The question is, does that vote translate into anything? And I think um, the gerrymandering is a huge issue. Uh, I think the money in politics is a huge issue because what's really happening is we have a situation now where we elect these representatives, but those representatives don't necessarily represent the people. And that's exactly right. I think um, we're really not going to get anything passed from a, um, a left side and especially even more so a progressive side of things if democracy is failing us all. If we're putting people in power who just fire all the people who are supposed to be in charge of these different agencies and you've got Bill Barr turning the DOJ into, you know, turning a blind eye to all these things are happening and the gerrymandering, especially where you have, you know, a minority of the state having a, you know, a vast majority of the representation, then there's no chance of getting any of this thing, this kind of stuff through. So to me, that's, I think, a thing that people on the left really should be priority number one is voting and not even just voting, but democracy, right? Because you can vote and still not really have democracy. There's plenty of countries right now where they have, you know, quote unquote elections and then the 97% of the population supposedly votes for the, 
the person who's already in charge. It's clearly not a democracy, and we're not near that, but we could be leaning that direction where well, we really need um, – we need we need to make sure that our representatives are representing the ideas of the people because it looks like right now there's there's ideas that are a lot more popular than their representation in government would show so that's a, that's a huge priority right well let me just ask you that then i mean you're saying that well there's a concern that in another 4 years we won't have democracy some people argue that the reason why we got donald trump in the first instance was because people didn't feel like their representatives they didn't feel like government was really listening to them so and I mean, there was that famous or like I should say infamous rather Princeton study in I think like 2014 that said that the overall popular will of the average person has no discernible impact on public policy. Right. right? So, you know, let me ask you then straight away, are, do we have democracy now or is that, you know, how do, how do you think about that? Yeah, and, and that's a good question because I actually, when I'm talking about democracy, I tend to a little bit temper things a little bit because uh, I find if, if I just come out and, and kind of talk about it straight, I lose people right at the beginning of the conversation. But I would say we have very little democracy right now, right? We have, um, if any, I mean, there's, there, uh, I don't know about the, the um, study that you just uh, quoted, but there have been plenty of other studies that you look at and you say, you've seen if, if 70 to 90 percent of the population thinks something should occur, there's about a 30% chance of that actually making it to the national level, which shouldn't be the case. If 70 to 90% of the people in this country want something, it should be enacted. And, so and, I would say we are already far from from having what, what we, like a lot of people walk around, they think we have a perfectly good democracy because they cast a vote, someone got elected, well, that's democracy, right? But I think when you dig down to it, I would say, in my opinion, the democracy is kind of in tatters. It's hanging by threads right now. And that's why I think this next four years is so important that if we don't turn it around now, I don't know how much longer we'll have this opportunity to turn things around with the democracy. Right. And well, and not only that, there's all kinds of laws and stuff that get passed that nobody actually supports. But then, you know, when it, right. when you, when it, you know, when, when it comes down to it though, people don't end up then voting out their representative who voted for right. that thing because other things start to supersede it. I mean, yeah. How, is there any way to to wrestle with that or i don't i don't know i don't know and that's hard because i definitely um many people that are that are in my life have a, a very opposing views to um my views right i grew up in a very republican uh area and republican style family and stuff like that so it's hard because you'll hear people complain about trump and badmouth trump but then at the end of the day they're going to vote for him again because they think that's yeah. going to lower their taxes. They think they're going to end up paying less in taxes. And so they're going to do it again because they, you know, that was sort of one of the ideas I grew up with was that uh, if the Democrats are in control, they're going to tax things so much that we just won't be able to even afford to pay our taxes. And then, you know, we, we don't have to go down that road. But, you know, what it seems if you look at it, it's not really about who spends more. It's really just about do you want to spend money on war? And, you know, going around the, the world and sort of trying to impose our will. Or do we want to spend money on on U.S. citizens? Right. Right. And, and, and I mean, the other thing, though, isn't just taxes. I mean, there's a lot of people who, you know, uh, get caught up on like abortion or these other kinds of issues, which are very important. But that, yeah. you know, you know, you could disagree with someone on every single other issue, you know, straight down the line. But then there's that one issue that, yep. you know, seems to be like incredibly important to people i mean how do you tell people that that you know th they should i mean it almost sometimes when i hear people t make these kinds of arguments i almost feel like they want to say that oh you should vote differently but how do you actually tell yeah. people to do that yeah and i don't i don't think it works and i think that's part of the idea that i was talking about earlier about where you try to do things at a local level so they kind of have mm -hmm. to have their eyes you know propped open to see that the the world's not going to end if you let some people go to college for free. The world's not going to end if you feed some poor people. The world's not going to end if you pay people a minimum wage that is, you know, livable where where someone can actually get by. Uh I it seems like a lot of times it, trying to explain things to a lot of the population doesn't work. I mean, I I run into a lot of people that, you know, they'll sit there and talk politics and they'll argue about stuff, but it's almost like you're having a philosophical argument. You're having like these thought experiments people like to do. But then when you actually talk to them about things like Merrick Garland, uh, 
you know, not not having his fair share in the, you know, when Obama appointed him for Supreme Court. They don't really know about these kinds of things. So uh, it's hard because I think a lot of people don't pay attention to politics. Right. So I. You know, they'll maybe spend uh, an hour a year or before the elect, you know, before they go vote, they might sit down for an hour and figure out what they need to vote for. But there isn't this kind of deep thought going on. And so I, I think people kind of have to well, they have to see these things working out. And the other thing, though, is there's a lot of research that shows that the more you actually learn about politics, the more polarized you become. I mean, right. How, how would you actually I mean, is there any way to get over that? I mean, it's, we it's seem hard. To going... I mean, I. Yeah, I would say that's I, I would say I'm an example of that. I mean, I, I grew up, like I say, in a in republic from a Republican standpoint. And those were kind of the things that I thought growing up. Right. Those were those were my ideas. And it was really in the second the second Bush term where I started to go, wait a minute, this this doesn't really match what I've been told all the all these years and what I've seen playing out. So I started to, to kind of investigate things and learn more. But I I would say I have been polarized. I used to be, you know, pretty far on one side of things. And now that I've switched, I'm now pretty far on the left. Right. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say to that point, it, it probably is more polarizing, but that's because it's I think it's easy if you're uninformed to sit in the middle a lot of t and not everyone's like this, but it seems like a fair number of people that just kind of sit on the fence. It's really that they don't know a lot about the politics that are that are going on, because mm -hmm. once you it seems like once you understand what's going on on the left, what's going on on the right, if you know who you are as a person, you're going to at least somewhat align on one side or the other. Right. So I don't I don't necessarily even understand people who are just clearly in the middle you know, when they're a week before the presidential election, they're not even really sure which side they should be voting for. It seems like like you brought up the abortion issue. The um, th That's a huge one that I don't know how to get around because it uh, it seems like we possibly wouldn't even be in the current situation if it wasn't for the abortion issue. I mean, with Mitch McConnell not letting that Supreme Court pick go through. So then they knew Trump was going to get an extra pick when he came in into things. And, you know, uh, supposedly that really motivated the right to get out and vote because they knew, oh, and, and you heard people talking about it. Oh, we're going to get Roe versus Wade overturned if we elect Trump in there. And I think anyone who really wanted to bring, you know, overturn Roe versus Wade, I think they voted. I think those people went out yeah, no, and, and cast votes. Yeah, I know. I, um, you know, the people I know, I know a lot of people who were in that situation. My parents actually voted for uh, for Donald Trump and they referenced the Supreme Court. Um, obviously, I right. disagreed with that decision, um, but that's, you know, that's the decision that they decided to make. Um, so let me ask you then. So one of the kind of debates or discussions that goes on then is what do we engage in first? Systemic change or sort of policy action? So there's kind of Medicare for all. Bernie Sanders attempted to meld that sort of distinction by arguing that you have to go up against moneyed interest to do that thing. What I hear from you, um, and I could be misunderstanding you, so make sure to you know clarify me if I am. But what I hear from you is that what you do is you engage in systemic change on the national level, you know, so, you know, various issues with gerrymandering, various issues with money and politics, and then you engage in policy action on the state level. That's a little bit different from Bernie Sanders' uh, the synthesis which Bernie Sanders made. Um, am I understanding you right? Or Well, I, I wouldn't. I, I think those things are true. I wouldn't limit it. I don't think you necessarily have to pin yourself into what do we do first, what do we do second, and like go down a list. Well, I think right. you can you're, kind you're of attack saying, all these fronts. Right. If I'm understanding but I think, you right, you're saying you do both. You do the systemic, but you do the systemic change on the national level, and then on the state level, you're doing the policy action, and then hope that that policy action bubbles up to the national level, and then since that systemic barrier has been removed, it can break free. Am I am I hearing you right? So, somewhat, and I'm not necessarily married to that. I mean, I, I can move on that position, but I, I try to be a pragmatist somewhat. I mean, I think sometimes in politics, you have to you have to remain connected to reality, right? We have the, like what we would love to happen if Bernie Sanders went in and made all his decisions and was able to get everything passed. I would be all for that. But I think from a practical standpoint, I think I mean, I think the reality is four years from now, we're not going to have Medicare for all. And I don't think we're going to have free college tuition four years from now. So I guess and if we could, if there was a way to enact that at the national level right now, I would get behind it and I would try to support it. But I, I think since we know that's going to be a long ways off no, anyways, right, if we ever get it, 
Um, I think those things are a long ways off. I think if I think one thing we can do in the meantime while we're waiting for these things to happen at the national level is try to push them at the state level um, to try to change change people's minds. I mean, you you know, there's other topics like if you look at gay marriage. I mean, gay marriage. It turned around in what 10 15 years and part of that was because certain states were saying okay you, Gay marriage is okay in this state gay marriage is okay in this state and we went in a matter of what 10 10 years There was this huge shift from you know what we've had for most of our history where um, There was a generally a negative view of gay and, and gay marriage to where now it's kind of a it's a normal thing at least in major parts of the country. It's not considered um um, lost my train of thought there. You know, it's not looked at the same way that it was. So, right. you know, you have these states, these by states allowing these things to happen or changing their laws or however you want to put it, I think it changes how people think about the situation. So I think that's kind of a way, you know, the whole hearts and minds. You can change hearts and minds at the state level and then still the whole time keep pushing to change things at the at the national level. Okay. Okay. So I, I hear that. So, but you don't necessarily think that like, you know, engaging in direct policy action on the national level, at least in the short, maybe even the medium term is, you know, just going to work. Not that you wouldn't want it, but like, you're just a little bit concerned about that. I'm not against it and I'm all for it. I mean, I'm all for when AOC stands up and she says things and they're controversial and people make a big deal about it. I'm all for it, mm -hmm. right? But if you look at the Green New Deal, I mean, how much progress has the Green the Green New Deal made since it was since she brought it up? I mean, it's not like that thing's going to be it doesn't appear like there's serious movement on getting that kind of legislation enacted. So I'm all for people right, but hopefully it and putting those ideas out there. Right. Yeah, it'd be great if it, I, I would support it if if there was a movement coming forward and mm. it, it looked like there was a chance. And and even when like right now, when there doesn't appear to be much of a chance of AOC making, you know, getting that Green New Deal pushed forward. But she's she has a voice on it and she's she's getting that message out to people. And some people hate that message. But it's that same kind of idea where the more you hear about something over a long period of time, it's going to change these hearts, hearts and minds, I guess. OK, so I'm seeing an interesting divide kind of here, um, like bringing up sort of between the national and then sort of more local concerns. Is the local confined to state governments or are we also talking general strikes and, you know, mass action protest, um, you know, um, convincing unions to strike um, for issues of climate? as opposed to merely issues of wage. Um, is there a, is there anything? Yeah, there? I mean, I'm all for, I'm all for voices being out there, right? I mean, I live near the, you know, I'm in Southern California. I've gone to protests that were being held in Los Angeles and you go to the marches and stuff like that. Um, I don't go to all of them, but I, I have gone to some. And I think that's important because it's a way of getting your, your getting some light shined on the topic that you're interested in. Um, unions, I'm a union member. I've been happily paying uh, union dues for over 11 years. I think unions are hugely important. And I think, uh, you know, it's one of the things I liked about Bernie is he kept talking about how important unions are. And I think more people should be in unions. I think more people should have the opportunity to be in unions. And I think when companies, you know, try to shut down uh, union formation, I think that's wrong. And I, I don't think that kind of thing should be allowed. But But unions... I don't know. It's a difficult thing, right? We, my union that I'm in, there was strike talk a few months ago because we haven't had a raise in a whole lot of years and, and they're actually trying to take benefits away from us rather than, than give us things. So I kind of feel like the current state of unions in the country is that even though people would look at my union and say it's a very strong union, I think our unions are so weak. I, we, we can barely get ourselves pay. Right. So I think standing up for something like climate change, although it would be a great idea, I don't know if that power is there, if there's enough. It could be. I haven't really spent a lot of time discussing that issue, but it's like we, we can barely get ourselves. You know, right now we're trying to fight just to keep what we had last year. And I don't even mean because of the virus. I'm talking about for, for years they've been trying to take more and more away from us. So it's it's I think one thing that should happen is unions should be strengthened. And there should be laws passed that you can't, you know, these companies can't come in and try to keep unions from forming and busting unions. And then, yeah, I would like to see a day where 
a large portion of the population is covered by a union and then those unions can work together and then maybe they could say something like, you know, we need to say that we're going to strike if, if action on climate change isn't taken. But I don't know if unions in their current state are strong enough to do that. They might be, but I don't know. Right. I mean, one of the concerns, though, is how do you actually make this kind of long term change without restructuring the corporation? Right. Because you end up in a situation which you're describing right now, which is that they keep wanting to scrape away benefits from you. They keep wanting to take more and more from you, which is inevitable with the way that things are, you know, the way that companies are currently structured. Do we need to rethink the corporation or are we yeah. just talking about strengthening unions and balancing out corporations? I, I think I think both. I think there needs to be major regulations. I know that's a sort of a trigger for people. You start talking about regulations, but I think regulations are there for a reason in general. And I think this idea where the corporations should be able to come in, basically suck a bunch of money out of a community or a population and then and then basically don't pay taxes on it. So they're not even paying back their fair share for it. I don't think that's okay. Um, I think we need to get away from this idea that every move we make in society needs to be about turning a profit. It needs to be about making some rich person richer. And I think we need to start asking ourselves the question, is this thing good for society, right? Is, is this a thing that society will be better with this happen? And of course, companies need to make a profit, right? I'm not trying to argue that no co corporation should ever make a profit. But if you look back, you know, 50 years ago, companies made profits 50, 60 years ago and, and further back when we had even even higher tax rates. Um, companies made profits, but they didn't have all these loopholes to make sure, oh, we've got a bunch of money parked in another country, so we don't have to pay taxes on that and we don't have to pay our workers a, a fair wage. So I think I think both things have to happen. I think unions need to be strengthened, right? We need to kind of turn back the mm -hmm. clock on unions and get them strong again. And then, yeah, I definitely would be for kneecapping the corporations so that this this ultimate level of greed where the shareholders and the CEOs get all well, the money. I think there should be a fair yeah. share going to the workers. I mean, I hear that. But the concern then is always that if you don't like completely restructure like, you know, worker ownership, then eventually what they're going to end up doing is those corporations are going to keep on, keep on, to, you know, scratching away. Um, carving right. away at those regulations, and then you end up in a kind of self-perpetuating system of capital. I mean, how do you right. actually, you know, like, I mean, can you really kneecap it, kneecap it, or are they just going to grow back? Is it, you know, the the <laughs> the guy from Hercules with the Hydra? Um, you know, you have to cut off all the heads, not just one. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's sort of the million dollar question, right? I mean, there have been um, there have been a number of people that have proposed this idea, and I think Bernie Sanders was at some point was talking about it, where you you take what what is the multiple that the CEO makes over the like your average worker or lowest paid worker? I can't remember. And if that multiple is too high, then then your taxes for that company go way up, right? So. And, and that's an example of a regulation. And, and your comment was, well, they're just going to turn around and try to remove these regulations. And that's true. I think we need to have and this kind of goes into part of what I think the left needs to do, which is our messaging. I mean, the reality is the right seems to be much more effective at messaging because they'll throw a message out there and their side instantly grabs onto it, even if it makes no sense or is completely illogical or it's just downright false. I mean, we've seen this with Donald Trump and McConnell. These people will come out and blame the Democrats for doing exactly what the Republicans are doing in that moment. And then people will just believe it. And they'll believe that the, the left is the one who, who are uh, who are doing all these terrible things. So I think part of it is messaging. And it's yeah, you're right. It's going to have to be a sustained period of the left being in charge in order to make sure that these regulations get put in place and that they stay in place. And so it's not this ebb and flow of, OK, now, you know, at the at 2020, we put a bunch of regulations in place and then by 2030, they're removed because we're seeing this with the banks. Right. The, since the since the downturn uh, 12 years ago or whenever it was, you know. And even before that, these regulations, Glass-Steagall and stuff, get implemented, and then they're removed, and then people try to put in some version of it, and then they're removed. And it's, yeah, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's a hard question. So there's a bit of a debate also between whether or not the best action is, you know, uh, to hope that Joe Biden wins. Obviously, you know, whoever you vote for is, you know, who you vote for. Uh, but, you know, the hope of the left, there, there's a debate, I guess, whether or not the left would want Joe Biden to win. 
or want Donald Trump to win in terms of, you know, being able to more effectively persuade uh, or more effectively move forward on their policies. How do you feel about that? Specifically, you broke out. You broke up for a second. What was Oh, my bad. Um, so I, I, I'm concerned a little bit or not. I shouldn't say concerned, but, you know, so there's a sort of debate there whether or not the left would benefit most from a Joe Biden presidency or a Donald Trump presidency. Um, obviously, neither of those being ideal, obviously. Right. Um, right. In terms of being able to get the policies um, enacted. I mean, in your specific case, you're talking about um, you're talking about engaging in policy action on the state level. Right. Um some people have argued that Donald Trump being in the presidency has really helped Democrats on the state and local level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. I, I'm concerned, but back to our discussion of democracy, if Donald Trump is elected, I'm just between mm -hmm. Bill Barr, Mitch McConnell, and Donald Trump. I mean, how much democracy are we going to have in four years? I mean, we've pretty much learned that impeachment is not really a tool Okay. to be used anymore because whatever party's in charge is just going to, at least the Republicans already did this once. We'll see if the Democrats ever have to do it, but they just ignore it and say, well, we're not going to, we're not going to vote against this person. Um, I, I yeah. think, and I, and I don't feel like the Republicans are in the situation where they've, they've done enough and they've go, okay, we, we've done enough. We can stop. I mean, the gerrymandering is going to get worse if they have the opportunity to make the gerrymandering worse, right? We've seen in States where, um, you know, what was it? I forget what state it was, but there was an incoming Democratic president so or Democrat president. So the state legislature tried to strip the governor position. Uh, I believe of that was the, North Carolina. Yeah. So, you know, I, I really think democracy is under attack and I don't know if we can take four more years of what we have. So there have been some benefits, I think, to Trump being in office on, like you mentioned, on the state level. I think I think there is a, a small slice of the population that has woken up to the fact that, whoa, this is this is way out of line. Well, but and I don't know. I don't know that Biden. I think Biden will be marginally better, but I don't see Biden really getting much in the way of progressive. Right. And, and I mean, the other forward. the other concern, though, is that, I mean, we saw the kind of backlash theory last time around, um, you know, leading up to the election with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. A number of people arguing that if Donald Trump got in, there'd be this massive left-wing kind of backlash. And while it does seem like Democrats have managed to pick up some seats in, you know, state areas, you know, in Virginia, we recently, the Democrats recently swept the House and, the, you know, the state House and the like. Um, so we've seen those kinds of wins. Um, but there hasn't been this kind of rise of the left. It seems in many respects, the left now isn't able to stand up, or at least Democrats, the liberals especially, aren't able to actually stand up for the things that they say they believe in. We're seeing it right now with the Tara Reid incident. So, I mean, it definitely yeah. seems like, I mean, how do you, how do you sort of play that or factor that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of feel like you got to try to go for everything you can. I mean, I think, I don't think Biden is going to be good for Democrats and I don't think Biden is going to be good for progressives. I think, you know, it's this whole argument, he'll be less bad than Trump is. But I'm, the hope would be that if you get everything blue and there's more and more questions coming up daily about Senate and the polls that are being done and possibly the Senate flipping. I mean, if you could have a blue house, a blue Senate, and even if it was Biden that was in there, I think that gives you the opportunity at the very least to maybe pass some laws that do protect this democracy. Right. So mm -hmm. address gerrymandering, address mail in voting all these kinds of things so that hopefully we could at least get the democracy somewhat secured or, you know, get it, get it off of life support so that it's functioning a little bit better and then try to move forward from there. I don't see these things coming out of Joe Biden, but I think if you've got a blue path for laws to move through and then you have people like AOC and, and these other people on the left, at least it, I feel like it would give them a little bit more of a voice to bring up uh, some of these policies that some of us would like to at least see discussed, even if, even if they're not going to come through into policy, at least they will have a larger stage for being part of the uh, the national conversation. Well, again, though, wouldn't Republicans then just take over the, you know, I mean, if there's that concern there that then Republicans start winning state houses and the like, as they did under Obama, that then they just decay and, you know, damage democracy on the state level. Is there any, I mean, is this just a, like, yeah. is this just, there's no way out or is there, you know, I'm, I'm trying to. Yeah, where we're just kind it. of herding cats around. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, and you're always going to get this this bounce back either way, right? So Trump came in, and then two years later, we saw this 
you know, the, the blue wave they were talking about. It's entirely possible that if everything goes blue in November, then you're going to get a red wave two years later, right? Especially in, in a lot of states. But it kind of seems like, I mean, it, this sounds terrible. Picking Biden might, might just, a good reason to pick Biden might just be to buy time. Because it seems like there are a number of states that are eventually starting to go blue. Like people are saying eventually Texas is probably going to be a blue state, right? We're not there yet. But people are saying that it's possible that Texas is eventually going to flip and a number of these states flipping towards blue could be helpful. So if we can kind of hold off the damage, right, put put the democracy in some kind of triage until we can actually have a few more states blue, then this might help the overall conversation at the national level. I mean, that's kind of predicting the future. Right. Who, who knows what's going to happen? But, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's hard mean, to say. I so I'm going to have to ask it to you then. Uh, do we really trust the Democrats to actually then fix democracy? I mean, we've been seeing a lot of just straight pragmatism, but like and by pragmatism, I just mean opportunism from the Democrats. Do we really trust them to secure the democracy? Yeah, I, I, I would say no. But but I certainly think I mean, I would say there's zero chance of the Republicans fixing democracy because they're the ones who are kind of stripping it, stripping it apart. The hope would be that with the Democrats, you could get you hopefully get some things through. I mean, there was the was it H.R. one, the House bill where they actually outlined a number of things in regards to voting and stuff like that, that they tried to put through. Now, it didn't go anywhere, but mm -hmm. you would hope that they could at least come up with some basics uh, to to put those those voting rights back in place. Do I trust the, the the Democrats will do that? No. I mean, Joe Biden is a Democrat and, you know, he, he has a history of talking about social cutting social security and doing these other things that don't even really seem like Democrat ideas. So uh, when it comes to politics and trust there, I don't really trust a whole lot of people <laughs> that are that are in politics right now. But I think, you know, and it's it's hard because you want to stand for an ideal, especially those of us who were behind Bernie Sanders. You want to stand for those ideals. And the idea of compromising and, and putting up with half measures is certainly not an appealing idea, but I guess I would choose them over the complete destruction of, of democracy, which is sort of the other choice. Well, but I mean, you were talking about, I guess what I'm really trying to get at here then is because you were talking about taking on systemic issues on the national level, right? That that's what we do. And then on the state level, we focus on policy and then hope that that bubbles up. But are the Democrats interested in taking on systemic issues. I mean, I don't see many Democrats. I don't see Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden said, I mean, this looked like it was from the onion. Joe Biden came out and said that he hopes to be a transitional presidency for to bring the Pete Buttigieg's of the world into right. office. Pete Buttigieg, we saw him hanging out in wine caves. Do we really right. think that the Democrats, can we really trust the Democrats to take on corporate interests in the way that you say? I, I think it's a thing that's going to take time. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. I, 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 there's no part of me that is, has this idea that if, if we turn everything blue, so House, Senate, and presidency mm -hmm. all go blue, I don't think it's going to be like this glorious day where everything is fixed and every, everyone's problems <laughs> are solved. In right. fact, I kind of think at the moment, like, like I kind of mentioned, I think it's going to be like hitting pause on things where we're able – it's kind of like what we're all doing right now. We're sitting at home. Hit it, we pushed pause on the virus for many of us that have the option of not not leaving the house. You're just kind of pushing pause on the problem while you figure out what to do about it. And I think um, that's kind of what would a Biden presidency would be. We're hitting pause while hopefully the country starts to realize um, this movement that seems to be happening where maybe there's more and more blue coming out in different states. Um, Maybe we could make a change then, but yeah, I, I, I'm not under the misconception that everything, if, if, if blue, if there's a blue wave this election, that it's, you know, the corporations are going to get under control and that we're going to have um, programs for people and that voting's all going to be fixed. I think there's going to, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on, on your point of view, politics is very incremental. And I wouldn't, I would prefer that it wasn't. I would love for Bernie to get in there and start implementing his programs, but I guess I'd rather see an incremental march towards that than nothing at all. In fact, we're kind of going in the reverse. For the past 40 years, we've been moving the opposite direction of Bernie Sanders' ideas. If we could at least maybe stop that, that bleeding and then try to, try to address things going forward. But it's not going to happen overnight, yeah. Yeah, okay.
All right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've uh, definitely enjoyed talking about these issues. Or, or did you have anything else to to add? Or uh, I think we covered most of it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. So um, I'm going to be linking down in the description your Twitter, your um, you know your your YouTube uh, political perspective, so that anyone can find you. And um, peace. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Of course, anytime.